Good. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Balm, Director of the Centre for Public Law, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Sir David Williams Lecture. The Sir David Williams Lecture was started in 2001 to celebrate the contribution to legal scholarship or, and to legal life of Sir David Williams. Sir David was an eminent public lawyer who specialised in the control of public power. He was one of the founders of modern public law in the United Kingdom, and his energy in launching administrative law in this university was recognised by the Faculty of Law, which is now trying to raise funds for a Sir David Williams Professorship of Public Law. From being the Rouseball Professor and President of Wolfson College, Sir David moved to be the first full-time Vice-Chancellor of the university. And in his retirement, he was energetic, and I mean that, very energetic, in raising funds for the university, for law, and for the Squire Law Library. But he was equally energetic in his support and encouragement of younger scholars. Um, we're very glad today to have with us um, Lady Sally Williams and members of their family. And we're also very grateful to Mr. Michael Russ and Mr. John Nolan, who through their generosity have sponsored this lecture, but who are unfortunately unable to be with us this evening. Our lecturer tonight is Professor Conor Geerty from the London School of Economics. Conor Geerty is a leading academic, barrister and public intellectual. Uh, Conor studied law at University College Dublin and took the LLM at Wilson College and then took his PhD in environmental law under the supervision of Sir David Williams. He became a fellow of Emmanuel College before moving to King's College London and in 2002, he moved to his present institution, the London School of Economics. First then as a rousing director of the Centre for the Study of Human Rights, and then more recently, as a, not only as professor of human rights law, but also the director of uh, the Institute of Public Affairs. He's a fellow of the British Academy and has published numerous books and articles predominantly in the field of human rights. Before the topic became fashionable, he co-authored an influential study of freedom under Thatcher, and in particular gave the Hamlin Lectures in 2005 on can human rights survive even before Chris Grayling and Theresa May were conceivable members of the government <laughs> front bench. <laughs> And as a barrister, he practices in human rights. He was a founder member of Matrix Chambers and has appeared before UK courts, the European Court of Human Rights, and the International Criminal Court in The Hague. He is a bencher of the Middle Temple. Through his personal website and his blog, he is transparent about his publications and has sought to influence opinion on a wide range of subjects. He's not afraid of controversy, and has given lectures in the past year on Michael Collins' terrorist or human rights worker and on imagining a Catholic future. He's chosen as his title one of Sir David Williams' influential books, Not in the Public Interest. That book demonstrated Sir David's passion for the accountable use of public power. He wrote that the ultimate danger of executive secrecy in a much-governed country is that it denies the knowledge essential for an informed public opinion. And he concluded that it is important that secrecy and security do not become ends in themselves. Though conditions have changed since 1965, Sir David's values remain inspirational, and we will hear from our speaker how those values, among others, apply in today's context. So it's with great pleasure that I invite Professor Conor Geerty to give his uh, Sir David Williams lecture on Not in the Public Interest. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for that lovely, lovely welcome. It's great to be uh, back here in Cambridge. It really is. It's years since I was here. It's amazing. How time flies. I mean, I've been here lots, but since I was properly here. 
And Sally, it's lovely to see you here, and Rhiannon and, and Reese. You'll be going off, I suppose, shortly to watch the runner-up yeah, battle. Uh, David, David was from Wales. He took the country very seriously, and there's a, a match for the wooden spoon in the rugby championship uh, between some other country called France and, and Wales, because Wales were hammered by another country. Can you remember, what was the score, Reese? I can't, just, I, I've had one of those mental blocks. Maybe this can come into the Q&A, we can talk about it. Uh, and, and also, so it is great to see you all here, it's fantastic. And uh, Mr. Ross and Mr. Nolan, you know, if they're watching in some, I was going to be rude about the luxurious life they lead, but probably watching in the midst of helping clients. Thank you very much for continuing to sustain this lecture series. I've been at many of these lectures before, and they're, uh, with the exception of 2014, usually really excellent. <laughs> uh, there is also a quirk to this year, which I think is rather humorous. I am the warm-up act for Mr. Justice John Laws. I came in. <laughs> I came in. Looking forward, and I'll admit to a degree of vanity, to seeing my own picture with uh, directions as to where to go. And I found a much larger, and if I may say so, marginally more attractive picture <laughs> of, of Lord Justice John Laws. And it looked briefly as though he was going to be over there. Uh, and there would be a sort of, I don't know what, television program, popularity contest. But he starts at 6.40 in another room. And I'm glad we started five minutes late and that John took an unwarrantably, but for me, delightfully long time to explain all my credentials, because we're already at a quarter to six. And if we extend the Q&A and bring into account the drinks, I have the idea that John will be talking, and we'll be outside getting, uh, enjoying ourselves. <laughs> so here we go. It'll take, I should think, about 40 minutes or so. And I, I think, uh, we start with David Williams, actually. I, would, I think I might be the first... Uh, student fist to do this, so I think I need to I need to do this because I first met him in the autumn of 1980. Uh, I was a refugee from legal practice in the Midlands of Ireland, uh, hoping to extend my studies as a way of avoiding the legal practice to which I had dangerously exposed myself by qualifying as a solicitor. Uh, David was the new president of a newish college, a place without a high table or any of those superior attitudes which I had assumed would be rife and to which I had so carefully prepared myself to be hostile. Uh, dinner in hall was Tuesdays and Thursdays, no high table, junior members mucking in with senior, a joyous democratic noise presided over by a man to whom, as it turned out, I was to owe my career. Uh, it's great that the, what do you call John, the vice president of Wolfson College is present. Good to see you. Uh, I don't mean when I say I owe David uh, my career in a conventional Cambridge sense, though it was, I am sure, David's interest in having a lawyer at Wolfson that helped me to stay on to do a PhD uh, under his supervision, and certainly it was David's support that allowed me to negotiate what was a tricky job interview for a fellowship at Emmanuel Cambridge, the panel being chaired by Edward Sands whom some of us will recall with a diffident smile. The, uh, not, not to be fair to say David's bosom pal. And uh, there had been a general election the night before. I'd forgotten I was doing an interview, had a party in my rooms, and at three in the morning, remembered I was, threw everybody out, and uh, turned up at this interview where both they didn't give me a rostrum and offered me a cup of tea in what turned out to be a saucer and a cup, and I rattled my way through it with Edward Sands asking, why do we need a lawyer at Emmanuel? So I owe David that particular career, and also actually giving me an opportunity to think about the bar, because it was through him I was introduced to David Calcutt, who became Master of Magdalen, and he was then uh, chair of the bar. So the point to all of this, David was constantly looking to give opportunities to his students, actually. Always on the lookout for the opportunity. Uh, but th that wasn't his, his legacy actually, uh, important though it all was. The, what I learned from, from his, this first significant uh, influence in my professional life was an attitude. And I, David grew to be the most influential academic administrator in the Cambridge of his day. Uh, those of you who didn't know him, he professionalized the post of vice chancellor, served in that post office at a crucial transitional phase, he sat on all sorts of large-scale government inquiries, entertained royalty, foreign dignitaries, but throughout it all, he never changed from the man whom I first met, already important, in 1980. 
always eager to know you, make you feel at home, interested, no matter who you were, or more often weren't. Uh, David loved young people. And you know what? Young people can tell. They can tell. If you're a teacher, you know. David loved young people. He taught them brilliantly. He surrounded himself with them, gave them chances to flourish with a kind of abandonment that suggested that generosity was at his very core. Now, he was also the most networked man, as we call it today, I ever knew. I mean, the 13 previous lecturers in this series are a roll call of distinction and a testimony to the fact great judges from around the world, philosophers of world class. John, I think, has given one himself, my rival this evening. Uh, <laughs> David knew them all. He even, I don't know if this is true, Sally, boasted of playing tennis with a Supreme Court judge, a lady judge, of which he was very proud, a woman judge. Uh, and they knew him, you know, this is an important thing. I've got the train and come up from London. They traveled, one I was at here, John Roberts, David's last one, actually, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. They traveled, they lectured, and they did this, you know, they get a lot of offers on account of David Williams, I'm not in his memory. And I do the same proudly, not occupying the space in the league of these predecessors, but I, I present myself emblematically and symbolically as a student of his, one of the many whose life has been touched so powerfully by his energetic warmth. Uh, I should say, because uh, it's right to say it, that this was also true of my late wife, Diane. Uh, and I say it because this was the very last event she attended three years ago and came to the dinner afterwards uh, because she was then very ill and became very ill afterwards and subsequently very sadly died. But she actually came as the last thing she did. So there's this tremendous memory we have about this event for that reason too. The attitude that David showed uh, wasn't just as a teacher. Uh, it was as a scholar. And the mark here has been profound on me too, and it frames the lecture. It frames the lecture. He wrote two books in the second half of the 1960s, which opened up a space for the kind of historical writing about law and civil liberties that was fresh and innovative for its day and which still reads so well today. I was just talking with Tony Bradley about it outside, how well these books read. And they read so well nearly 50 years ago because they're not theoretical. They're not trying to impose a grid of meaning uh, on stuff. They are rather books that go with the flow of humanity. What Kevin Gray, who's here, once called Real People in a book title, rather oddly. David's law was messy, uncertain, incomplete, packed full of the sorts of loose ends which theoreticians hate but lovers of humanity adore. David was an historian at heart, did two years history before he changed to law, and in his hands, book law came alive as a series of stories about power, politics, people. So as John has said, I've taken the title of this lecture, is it up there, not in the public interest, published in 1965, and concerned he described it at the time as the passion for secrecy in government. And then it manifested, uh, this is David writing in 1965, manifested in the Official Secrets Act, the 50-year rule, as it then was, the security service, the press and executive secrecy, the ombudsman, crown privilege, de-notices, and the nuclear disarmers. Now, the book had the kind of impact that, if it were around today, would have turned David into a sort of iconic ref case study. Because, but many of his subjects have not remotely dated. Uh, the final sentence in the introduction will be one any of us would be proud of today, uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, if we wrote it, we'd write it with pride. And it's this, the ultimate danger of executive secrecy in a much governed country is that it denies the knowledge essential for an informed public opinion, and that it inhibits effective scrutiny and criticism of the government and the administration. That's David writing in 1965, and it is a sub-theme of today's lecture. Uh, the subtitle of his book was The Problem of Security and Democracy. What would David have made of the Snowden revelations, of the phenomenon of Edward Snowden? A legal opinion released last month, commissioned by Tom Watson, MP, 
as chair of the all-party parliamentary group on drones and written by Jemima Stratford QC and Tim Johnson of Brick Court Chambers, has painted a picture of disturbing levels of surveillance and possible data transfer, all of which is, in their view, of dubious legality. And I want to just stop there and reflect, as we all do, on the Snowden revelations and remind you of that word, dubious. This ought to be surprising. What ought to be surprising is that it's even arguable that such activity is lawful, alleged activity, because as uh, Stratford and Johnson make clear, the government has, quote, refused to confirm or deny the existence of the program. But what I wanted to think about is how could such a thing not be self-evidently unlawful? It may be lawful. And moreover, as they point out, lawful, not in some peculiar prerogative kind of way, pseudo-legal dictate by a minister of the sort that David Williams used to delight in exposing, but rather lawful on account of empowering legislation enacted by Parliament. In this case, the Regulatory of Investigatory Powers Act 2000, known to everybody by the shorthand, not everybody, people who went to this, REPA. Now, we've seen something similar this week. Uh, we can ask John Laws about it. He gave the lead opinion in the decision on Miranda. And uh, there, we find that the detention of David Miranda for the maximum of nine hours at Heathrow Airport was in fact lawful under the Terrorism Acts. Under the Terrorism Acts, in particular Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act 2000. Uh, we need to be careful before we immediately assume that's a bad decision because that's the law. And again, I want to return to this point of legal legitimacy a bit later on. And then, what would David have made of a little notice case decided at the end of December 2012 by Lord Justice Moses and Mr. Justice Simon, both excellent judges, sitting in the administrative court. The case is called R on the application of Noor Khan versus the Secretary of State for the Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs. The claimant, Noor Khan, asserts that employees in GCHQ were and are providing intelligence to the U.S. for use in drone strikes in, among other places, Pakistan. And that as such, they are at significant risk of being accomplices to murder and are, quote, conduct ancillary to crimes against humanity or war crimes. Uh, the facts, as alleged, I put as alleged, these things are not conceded, there are no factual findings in these cases, were rather nevertheless poignant. On the 17th of March 2011, the claimant's father, Malik Daoud Khan, was presiding over an outdoor meeting of the local Yerga to settle with other elders a commercial dispute. A missile was fired from a drone, and the claimant's father was killed with 49 others who were attending the Yerga. Now, it was surely inevitable, and from a legal point of view, uh, right, that the judges should have declined to be drawn into any discussion of the legality of the actions of a foreign power, specifically here, of course, importantly, uh, a friendly one, the United States of America. The judges found it, quote, hard to see the point of any declaration which merely says that those who pass on intelligence may be at risk of breaking the law if their activities and their state of mind fall within the scope of the relevant sections of the Serious Crimes Act 2007. What's the point of such a declaration? And so here, it's not possible to produce, they say, a meaningful declaration which identifies the necessary mens rea without, specific re without reference to specific facts. Uh, I gave a lecture at the guys who do the intelligence work, and I mentioned in passing this, and there was quite a lot, a lot of anxiety in the room, actually, about drone attacks. Uh, I mean, it's quite interesting. There was definitely a concern by these people, this kind of number, people who sit at desks and look at stuff. Uh, I, don't, I didn't mean that humorously. It's kind of... Uh, 
Now, as with Snowden, the court's not dealing here with any kind of residual prerogative power. As with Snowden, as with Miranda, they're saying there's a committee in Parliament that looks at these things. There's a special court, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. There is the Special Intelligence Service and Interception Commissioners, all established by statute, available. And therefore, the judges say, there is no basis on which this court, this is a quote, no basis on which this court could or should conclude that a declaration would fill a void and impose the rule of law on a lawless territory. There is no lawless territory. We have all these commissioners. We have this tribunal. And as for the Americans, as the Americans, uh, Lord Justice Moses says this, the claimant cannot demonstrate that his application will avoid during the course of the hearing and in the judgment giving a clear impression that it is the United States' conduct in North Waziristan, which is also on trial. And then the key thing, which could be put as the kind of subheading of my lecture, this is Alan Moses, to go down this route will be, quote, damaging to the public interest without any countervailing justification or advantage. In short, there is no, re there is no need or reason, Alan Moses' exact words, to go there. It's not exactly a refutation of the argument. We're not going there. We're not going anywhere either as a result of the Gibson report, are we? Uh, there's a haunting resemblance to Gibson, finally published in the days before Christmas last year after a delay of some 18 months. Uh, the chair, Sir Peter Gibson, and his team found evidence of British involvement in rendition and of awareness of ill treatment of detainees by, quote, liaison partner from other countries. Not us, the other guys. We're helping the other guys. We know who the other guys are, just like we were in the drone case, or not. Uh, Gibson concluded there were many questions left open about the training of key frontline staff and about how the government and the agencies went about providing information to Parliament. This is torture we're talking about, and actually working with liaison partners engaged in torture. Uh, the report was explicitly interim, uh, but it set out 27 questions in the annex that needed urgently to be addressed. Uh, but this won't be done now by an independent judge-led inquiry, uh, which had been promised and which had led to the Gibson inquiry. Uh, the government said, publishing the report, that this would now be handed to, yes, a parliamentary oversight body, the Intelligence and Security Committee. The Intelligence and Security Committee. Uh, Dame Janet Paraskeva, who sat alongside Sir Peter, has reportedly expressed deep disappointment at the transfer of responsibility to a body that is only on one occasion ever met in public. Uh, how right is she in her remark that she remains hopeful that the detainees will get their chance to have their say? Well, I evoke a contemporary of mine at Wilson College, uh, an excellent Conservative MP, Andrew Tyree, was a man who said, quote, it is deeply shocking that Britain facilitated kidnap and torture. All these examples, <clears throat> the latter ones, Miranda, Snowden, the drones, Gibson, they're not about direct engagement with deeply disturbing behaviour. That's what's interesting. That's what Andrew Tyree grasped. They're about facilitating it. And that's quite an important change that I want to talk about. Because as compared with the past, the nature of what must not be disclosed is different. And I'm going to make a, a sort of a distinction here between, for want of better distinction, the colonial period and the Cold War period. During the colonial period, it was direct state violence by the British forces abroad that needed, in the name of security, to be denied, that it was not in the public interest to acknowledge. This traditional kind of imperial cover-up has not entirely gone away. Uh, who cannot have been moved by the testimony of an array of elderly Kenyans giving direct evidence in an English court of their brutalization at the hands of British forces or who can have failed to have been affronted 
And this was the subject of a British Academy letter to the paper uh, by a number of us. Uh, by the secrecy with which the Foreign and Commonwealth Office has continued doggedly to shroud its vast archives of colonial activity in secrecy. Uh, if we include Northern Ireland within this broad colonial or quasi-colonial remit, we have, of course, many further examples of direct state action in the past, which was shocking and needed to be covered up. Why, in a moment, but it was direct. Uh, extended detention, police and army brutality, uh, and even, as we now know, underlined no, uh, what, if it were happening in a country we didn't like, we would call death squads. Sudden killings of political representatives, journalists, and lawyers by forces which were not part of the state, but which were working with the support of the state in the United Kingdom and quite recently. Now, during this imperial period of direct executive wrongdoing, what public interest could there possibly have been in the protection of such shocking behavior from exposure and in the maintenance of secrecy that allowed for none of the effective scrutiny and criticism for which David Williams argued at the start of the book that has become the centerpiece of this lecture? So why, why, well, first of all, why do it? And then why hide it? First of all, of course, this happened because there was an imperative which was to preserve the status quo. Uh, the control of the colonies. Uh, it's astonishing how Britain thought after the Second World War, as did France, that they could reassume control over the world. And we forget that that was the belief that drove the violence of the colonial period. Uh, but also an enforced peace in Northern Ireland. But why did what was being done need to be hidden? Well, answering that question for a moment about the past helps us, I think, to understand the present, the current vogue for what Andrew Tyree so rightly called facilitation. Uh, there's a marvelous chapter in another great legal historian's book, uh, Brian Simpson, uh, Human Rights and the End of Empire, which gets right to the core of what I'm trying to talk about today. Uh, the 1940s, uh, the Attlee administration, they're thinking of signing up to the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, the British are, however, of course, looking to extend and reassert their global power, as though the Second World War, as I said, had never happened. The Colonial Office puts up stout resistance to the Convention. Uh, you mustn't sign it, they say, or words to that effect. And then, more or less, have you any idea what we do? More or less, in polite civil service English. Uh, they were right to be cautious. Uh, they were in what Michael Ignatieff, uh, in a controversial book, which I've criticized myself, but he got to the essence of something important here, I, I would say by accident. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I put that in. That was so gratuitous. <laughs> Michael has a lot of time in his hands, and he might be looking at this. Uh, in a controversial book about the response to the 11th September attacks, it was called uh, The Lesser Evil. Uh, he called the people who do the uh, brutalization for us, he called them the carnivores, which in his mind was a term of praise. And the colonial office were the carnivores. They were the guardians at the gates who allowed us, the rest of us, the herbivores. You guys in the room, you know, the intellectuals, us, to enjoy our way of life with all its apparent commitment to freedom, equality, and the rule of law, while not having our belief in these disturbed. The colonial carnivores knew what was going to come if you signed up to something which was about human rights and meant anything at all. Now, the first case in the 1950s immediately was all about Cyprus. The colonial officers right there. That was endless, uh, chaotic. And then, of course, in the 1970s, some years later, we had, from the British point of view, the disaster of Ireland versus the United Kingdom, which case was able to shed really shocking light on degrees of ill treatment and brutality in Northern Ireland, meted out to uh, members of the nationalist community who were suspected. Uh, more recently, in a most interesting development, there has been a whole series of cases which have 
uh, held authorities to account not only for inhumanely treating and often killing unfortunately innocent Iraqis, but also brutalizing, almost casually killing our own troops in Iraq. Uh, cases of bullying, cases of reckless, dangerous training, cases of failure to provide adequate equipment, equipment when on patrol, these have all got to the European Court of Human Rights. Strasbourg's been dealing with them, that's where the court is, to the fury of ministers and other enthusiasts for the armed forces. I heard a Secretary of State for Defense, I think it was a Secretary of State for Defense, say how this is going to make war impossible. All these cases that don't let us kill our own people by sending them out on bicycles, you know, <laughs> because we're saving a bit of money, because we need to belt tighten, unless we're a conservative area that's been flooded. Sorry. John, you're going to have to keep an eye on me here. Uh, the imperial public interest in keeping such matters undercover, the interest that explains the colonial office's resistance to the convention, is not about protecting individual soldiers or even generals from being accountable. Cultures like ours, systems like ours, can afford a few rotten apples, can even strengthen their sense of their own righteousness by occasionally throwing such aberrants to the lions of justice. Look how good we are while there's a police officer in jail. What the system cannot have is exposure of the extent to which it is constructed on what are, after all, a set of lies. That was what concerned the colonial office, rightly, in the late 1940s. It is all very well for the country to believe itself special, a place where justice reigns and civil liberties and the rule of law are the norm, where fairness and respect for the individual are in the lifeblood of the nation. These are important things to believe. They might have been essential even in order to have got through the terrible war that had just ended. But the past and it was then hoped future prosperity of the nation were built on a level of exploitation of the foreigner that was too terrible to be acknowledged. That's the past. How does this fit with the present? The universality of human rights and the turn to law that this shift seems to signify were dangerous because they were potentially so destabilizing to this nation's sense of self. Security demanded secrecy because too much truth could not be countenanced. That is a strong public interest. That is a strong public interest in, in secrecy. Protect us from knowing what's happening that makes our lives possible. Now, today, direct action on the imperial law model is more or less over. Uh, we're not fighting any wars next year, according to the Guardian for the first time in 100 years. Uh, although they kind of cheat by including some low-level violence. But nevertheless, it's still rather dramatic. In truth, the Cold War, which overlapped with this colonial and pseudo-colonial period, was always about facilitation. So I said there were two, the colonial and the Cold War model. The colonial model is direct action, and the Cold War model has always been facilitation. Britain's always been number two. For a little period in the 50s, it thought it mightn't be, but then it was put back in its place by Eisenhower, and it's always been number two, facilitating, pleasing the Americans. Now, when this public interest ran up against law, the law usually buckled. Not going there in uh, Alan Moses' uh, characteristically attractive and frank phrase. Now, of course, not going there during the Cold War came with a cost. The rule of law appeared frayed at the edges, not as complete as theory required, and as its enthusiasts so loudly proclaimed, not so majestically impartial as Dicey had said, and as university tutorials, some given by me, sought constantly to ram home. But that was okay as long as these departures from the mainstream could be presented simply as that, departures from the mainstream, one-offs, curiosities, oddities. The mainstream is freedom, the rule of law, liberty, and there are these margins. But there are only margins. Uh, th that was how Dicey, I went into this in great detail once, that's how Dicey explained why all his theories in the 19th century 
uh, which were exemplified by a case about which you won't mind me saying David was almost obsessed, BG and Gilbanks. Do you remember BG and Gilbanks? <laughs> now, I mean, he'd bring everything round to dinner, BG and Gilbanks, BG and Gilbanks, Western Supermare. He brought a picture of Western Supermare into a lecture. BG and Gilbanks was a salvationist who were allowed march. But the next year, the Irish, uh, uh, the Irish rent uh, people uh, were, were beaten up by a mob, and it, it didn't apply, didn't apply. And Dicey has a footnote saying, uh, this shows you the limit or something. So as long as it's peripheral, it doesn't damage the mainstream idea. Uh, and I, another, that's why it's possible, for example, the famous case in the 1960s is called the Soblin case, written about by a predecessor of mine, Irishman Paul Higgins here, many, many years ago. Uh, that was where there was basically, Soblin was exported in a, disguise, a disguised extradition out of here to the United States. He was uh, involved in the Cold War battles. Uh, and it was scandalous, and Lord Denning, I think it was, refused to go there. And a contemporaneous comment in the Criminal Law Review, had the country demanding Dr. Soblin's return been Mexico, for instance, or Finland, the examples are random, the story would not have been the same. But it was a Cold War situation, and the Cold War is an enemy of decency and consistency. So that explains Soblin. It also explains Hosenbaum, 1970s case. Uh, American thrown out, deportation in the, for the public good, in the interest of national security, Lord Denning, no reasons need to be given. These are margins. Well, David Williams was very good at looking at this margin, that margin, this margin, that margin, saying, wow, there's a lot of margins. Where's the center? And bringing the margins together and telling a new story. Building a new truth where the margins are central, not peripheral. So, what truth do we have today? When the rule of law and the protection of human rights have never been stronger, and yet despite this, the tentacles of the security state have become ever longer, more pervasive, and the desire to facilitate the Americans is as pressing as it ever was when safety from Soviet attack was the central policy goal. It was war, hot, cold, or colonial, which held law largely at bay where foreigners and enemies were concerned. But we don't have a credible war basis to resist the movement of law and human rights today. And in fairness to the British government, successive governments have never made e stupid assumptions about the so-called war on terror. We haven't used that here as a kind of alibi, the way the American uh, government under Bush did. So law and human rights have been able to make progress, but at a price. Uh, how can it even be arguable that what Snowden has revealed can have been lawful? We live in a world of human rights and legality. How can Miranda have been detained for nine hours under terrorism laws? Where could the legal edifice come from that allows the Court of Appeal to dodge the drones issue? Our facilitating the killing of large numbers of people by pointing to statutory safeguards and even a special tribunal. How could law and human rights have ended up in such a place? The last bit of the lecture is telling you how I think it's happened. There's not much to go. I know some of you need a pointer, and John Laws is probably outside getting a bit. <laughs> what the hell's going on? The process started even before the end of the Cold War and as far away from Smiley's people as you could imagine, in a courtroom in Newington Causeway. Uh, there was an antique dealer on trial. We get a lot of kicks out of this when we teach it, the Malone case. Uh, he was charged and later dis acquitted of dishonest handling of stolen goods. He's being tried. Police officer gives evidence, looks down at his notes and says, and then he said this, and then he said that, and they all look up and say, how do you know that? He says, I was listening to his phone. Whoops! Shouldn't have said that. And it turns out that the government, since one of these Lord Chancellors, has been authorizing intercepts after dinner. Uh, shades of Entwick and Carrington, for those of you who need legal references in this lecture. Uh, Vice-Chancellor McGarry, Sir Robert McGarry, a very distinguished lawyer, wrote a judgment which is far too long, 
which exonerated the authorities and perplexed generations of students and those who teach them, uh, saying it was all right because the government can do what it wants. But Strasbourg came to the rescue in the mid-80s, in this case called Malone in the United Kingdom, saying, look, I'm sorry, human rights means law. Doesn't mean you, you have to have guaranteed privacy, Mr. Malone, but there needs to be a law that regulates when we can listen in. And uh, in those days, with the uh, Mrs. Thatcher, uh, an absolute epitome of good manners when it came to Europe, talked a little bit at home, but this thing was uncontroversially implemented in English law called the Interception of Communication Act 1985. One of the most important because uh, hegemonic shifting to misuse Gramsci, piece of laws we've got, because that's where the model was put in place. Whereas before you could snoop uh, under the vague royal prerogative, now you could snoop because the law allowed you snoop and the law was parliamentary law. Uh, it's all there. Ex-judges are dragged in to oversee things. A complaint system is set up. And it worked. Strasbourg went away. They didn't go away if you could show there was no law. But if you could show there was a law, Strasbourg went away. There was a poor woman, Manchester Merseyside Police, whose phone was being listened to. And she couldn't prove it was being listened to. And the law was in place. So she lost where Malone had won. So law wasn't the catastrophe. The secret state thought it might be. Uh, catching the mood of the times, and with admirable foresight, the security service, MI5, went down the same route just months before the fall of the Berlin Wall. The intelligence service followed suit in 1994. Gone from the shadows they were, as Ian Lee and Loris Luskarten said in a book they wrote at the time, in from the cold. This is what the preamble to the 1994 law said. Quote, an act to make provision about the secret intelligence service and the government communications headquarters, including provision for the issuance of warrants and authorizations, enabling certain actions to be taken, and for the issue of such warrants and authorizations to be kept under review, to make further provision about warrants issued on the application by the security service, to establish a procedure for the investigation of complaints about the secret intelligence service, and the government communications headquarters to make provision for the establishment of an intelligence and security committee to scrutinize all three of these bodies and for connected purposes. I think we have, Minister, were you involved in that at the time, David? Absolutely. Fascinating to hear. Took it through. I'm not going to blame David Davies for the collapse of liberty and freedom. <laughs> he believes himself, poor misguided man, that he's in favor of both. Wouldn't be this. You can have an answer back. Uh, the Reaper which is a stumbling block from clear illegality in the Snowden case, followed in 2000, the same year as the Terrorism Act, which did for Miranda this week. The lesson was clear. If local and Strasbourg courts were intent in the name of the rule of law as part of human rights, upon ensnaring with red tape executive action, direct and facilitative, that had previously been outside the law, then it was time to ensure control over the kind of red tape that was to be required. Crucial point, the devil is in the detail. Detail is not the strong point, with admirable exceptions, is not the strong point of a lot of politicians, and it's certainly not the strong point of the journalists. So new worlds of only apparent openness were created. Innovative functionaries who had judge-like qualities might even once have been judges, might be judges, were conjured up from the ether to provide assurances. I'm tempted to say Sir Malcolm Rifkind was invented, but I won't say it because that would be unnecessarily rude. <laughs> Parliamentary committees were created, their grandeur a mask for their impotence. And if courts manage to force their way in, their cases should be in secret. Lawyers can represent their clients, certainly, but without meeting them and only after being vetted by the state, a new kind of quasi-independent official called a special advocate. And the Justice and Security Act of last year comes from the same stable. If people insist on suing the state for allegedly torturing them, yes, allegedly torturing them, the state demands total secrecy, even extending to the litigant him or herself as the price of such proceedings. Now, this is my point in summary. In the old days, the war emergency activities of the state 
stood apart from the league. Here were two domains which rarely, if ever, intersected. Bad behaviour could be hidden in total darkness. Unknown unknowns. The wrestling philosopher, Don Rumsfeld. <laughs> the march of the rule of law has made such a position unsustainable. But in the process of reaching into this domain, law now finds itself irretrievably changed. Drained of critical energy, fatally diluted in the safeguards that can offer those affected by the exercise of state power. In place of unknown unknowns, we now have known unknowns. The advocates who can't speak to their clients, the courts that won't let you in, the parliamentary committees that sit in private, the former judges that sign off reports which are more redacted than informative. Very last section of the talk. Why have we allowed this to happen? There are no colonies to protect, and not even Northern Ireland to prevent from declining into civil war. Why have we, who are we? That's what I want to end on. Because I think it's too easy for us all to agree, oh, it's the government. It's all of us. I am nearly say we, but the British, I should say we for the purpose of this talk, but the British like their past. The British are proud of it. They see in the Second World War their finest hour, think of themselves as decent colonialists, and nowadays feel good as purveyors of human rights abroad. They feel good as a vital link in the global war on terror. Brainy facilitators of those who have the muscle we no longer have. On the whole, the British people, it seems to me, don't seem to mind having all those ships and aircraft and American nuclear weapons and soldiers and so on that make up the armed forces. They remind the British and us that for all that has changed, all the brick countries and the money from other people and so on, we still punch above our weight. All true, but not the whole reason for this drift of language into ethical abeyance. I think this vision of Britain, I think it, it's one of the reasons it's happened. But we've drifted into ethical abeyance, I put it as strongly as that, for another reason too, my final point. Democratization in this country was always only roughly achieved. There has been war throughout the entire democratic period. And of course, there's never been a revolution. So we haven't got a starting point. Now, war has tamed the democratic instinct in this country. I'm not suggesting war is fabricated. There has been war. This is not an nonsensical point about that. But war has tamed the democratic instinct in this country. It's replaced one idea of security, social security, human flourishing, potentiality, equality, fairness, and opportunity for all with another a security linked to land, a security defined by opposition to enemies. War has contaminated the wonderful possibilities of true equality, and the institutions it has justified have lingered on into peacetime, are now even recruiting onto their side a language, that of law, and to an extent also human rights, that used to be energetic and spirited, but which in their hands has become a mere accomplice to secrecy and official impunity. It is understandable, I suppose, a kind of post-imperial trauma and yearning, or pity, post-imperial trauma and yearning. But it's certainly not in the public interest. Thank you very much. That's it.